They put me back into one of the unmarked black cars. I hadn't been actually arrested yet, but it was clear that was coming. They became a bit sloppy, or maybe relaxed. They put me next to a door instead of in the middle. I started to think about escaping. During the many stops in traffic, I could have easily opened the door and ran. I wasn't in tip-top shape, but I was in better shape than most of the agents, and I didn't smoke like a chimney. The two agents in the front talked in Bulgarian, still oblivious to the fact that I could understand them. If you had a fake passport, they sat on the black markets in Sofia. Why can't it be a passport, though? Why not a good one like a Canadian one? Too hard to fake well. He's in a fake some unknown country. Why does he have a fake passport, though? Who is this guy? Don't know. But the Americans want him badly. You have any more cigarettes? Sure, friend. Here you go. They both lit up, and the car again filled with smoke. We arrived back at the Bulgarian police station, and the translator left. I hadn't had food or water in over 18 hours. Hey, the chief said I'd be fed and watered. We went to a nearby cafe and bought three bottles of water. They took me to a new office, and I sat on the couch. No one spoke, but I understood the two new officers were there to babysit. Here I found the legendary Bulgarian unicorn, a non-smoker. An officer was sitting behind a desk, and the office was clearly his. Next to him was the sign. I read it and then glanced at him. Without saying a word, he smiled and nodded at me. It was a friendly gesture, so I assumed it was about the no smoking, not the other part. Veronica returned about an hour later with yet another officer. Please go with his policeman. He will take you to another place. Leave your suitcase here, but take your food. Take off your belt and shoelaces. Leave them here. I followed him outside, and he took me to another nearby building. It was the jail. The jail cell had a wet cement floor and a single small opening with bars. I thought it was a temporary cell, but it wasn't. I was here for the night. The jail was near a university and was this local drunk tank for drunks and fighters. It was winter in Bulgaria and I was here to light rain jackets. The bench was L-shaped and narrow with wide gap slats. It was difficult and painful to even sit on. If you fell asleep, you fell off the bench onto the wet floor. Another person arrived about two hours later. He spoke Russian and his name was Peter. Peter was drunk and was in a fight. We chatted to pass the time and later tried to sleep. Now there were three rowdy and loud drunks. Only the clothing on our backs was allowed in the cell. Other items could be requested from the guard through the opening. Even my water bottles I had to ask for, drink, and give back. The others didn't bring water. They were Bulgarian, and so as required by Bulgarian citizenship, each arrived with multiple packs of cigarettes. They asked for them one by one until they smoked them all, until the cell became a gas chamber. Guard, is there any chance of a blanket or maybe a pillow? <laughs> oh, maybe I could get you a television, too. The guard meant no malice. He didn't have any blankets to give us and was just having some fun. In fact, he was very friendly no matter how often we asked for water, cigarettes, or to go to the bathroom. He always obliged kindly and never expressed any annoyance. The others carried on long, friendly conversations with him in Bulgarian through the hole. Only half my torso could fit on the bench, but it was better than the wet floor, which the later arrivals had. Finally, three of us were able to assemble a snug human triangle and were able to wedge ourselves in a way that we didn't fall on the floor and got about two hours sleep. The fourth man was still out of luck. Eventually the triangle collapsed and was back to talking and smoking. A family arrived and were put in the office across the hall. They seemed to be waiting for someone, but I never learned why they were here. After about an hour, they were taken down the hall and I never saw them again. They could only hold you for 24 hours without a judge's order, so you should be free in the morning. Good luck. Apparently he was an experienced jailbird. Somehow Peter fell asleep again. The other two only spoke Bulgarian, but as it shares some things with Russian, I gave it a go. Bouncing back and forth, I was able to communicate basics with one of them. The other man listened in, but didn't want to waste any breath that didn't involve a cigarette. He told me where and what bus to catch and the cost. I wanted to find Victor the lawyer. Peter woke up and we chatted again. Later I staked out the space by the small hole in the wall. From there I could see outside down the hall and waited for the sun to rise. It began to snow. One might think this was the worst night of my life, but I've had an adventurous life, and this doesn't even come close. I was the first to be released. As the sun was rising, a police officer came for me. Peter was still asleep. How, I don't know. Maybe the hangover finally knocked him out. We returned again to the main building, and I was given my belt back. After a short wait, Veronica returned. Now I go in my car to another facility. A facility? I was told that I could only be held 24 hours without a judge's order. You are not arrested. You are detained. The rules are different. You will have a hearing soon. Detained. This was the beginning of years of wordplay, which the U.S. government would sponsor and play with great exuberance. Veronica, two police officers, and I got in the back of a black car. Well, attention to the detention center. It is a special place for people waiting for court. It is not a prison. The difference between a prison and a detention center becomes important later. It was a prison, just a special type. More wordplay. We arrived at the Bulgarian prison, my new Bulgarian home. It was a six-story building inside a gated and guarded compound. As we approached, I saw many of the windows were broken. 
Veronica, this might seem strange, but I would like it for you to translate something for me to the officers in the car and at the station. It is also for you to hear as well. I want you to thank everyone for acting professionally and not taking sides. Everyone helped me the best they could, given the situation. No one mistreated me, and several went out of their way to assist me as they could. The situation for me is, of course, not a comfortable one, but I appreciate what was done for me. She seemed visibly surprised. After a small pause, she translated for the driver and the officer in the back seat with me. I thank you for your kind words and wish you luck in resolving your situation. I will tell the officers at the station also. The jail cell could barely hold four standing people. That's how tiny it was. It was one of two cells in the screening area just inside the door that would soon become familiar. After the guard completed the paperwork, he motioned for me to stick my hands through the bars and he handcuffed me. He opened the cell and motioned for me to walk in front of him. Another guard appeared and we followed him to an office. The office had a desk and a small table surrounded by two chairs and also an open door to the next office. The guard removed my handcuffs. We'd only walked maybe 40 feet, so the handcuffs seemed an unusual measure, especially I was already inside the prison. I learned later why they were so precautious. The embassy told them that I was violent. He pointed at my waist, then my feet, and then the desk. This was the first word anyone had spoken to me since I had arrived. I had no idea what it meant. He didn't speak English or Russian. I stared at him and made it clear that I didn't understand. Why were so many windows broken in my Bulgarian prison? Ventilation. The cells were sealed tight, nearly airtight. Prisoners had unlimited cigarettes and smoked non-stop. There were two layers of windows. The ones seen here are the outer ones. The inner one was not transparent, but had a small sliding metal hatch about the size of a large phone that could be opened, but revealed another non-transparent window. It offered little ventilation around the edges only. The outside world was not visible. Because of this, prisoners broke the outside windows through the small hatch so they could see the outside world and add some ventilation. The guard pointed at my nuts. Tuka. My face rapidly changed from confused to concerned. This got his attention. He touched my belt and pointed at my shoes. Fortunately, he wasn't interested in my nuts, but instead my belt and shoelaces. He pointed at the desk and again said Tuka. He also wanted my jacket because it had a drawstring in the hook. A slim, gray-haired, older guard entered from the adjoining office. He directed and helped the other guard fill out an inventory list of my items. He seemed to be the senior guard. Next, they went through my suitcase. They never said anything to me except Tuka. They pointed at things in my suitcase and then pointed at the desk, one of the chairs, or the table and said Tuka. It became clear they were sorting through my items. I thought Tuka meant suitcase. Then I thought it meant not allowed. Neither guess was correct.